Hi, Jessica Morehouse here. I did something really cool last week. I hosted and organized my very first event. I've had this idea in my head for a few months now, and finally it happened last week. Uh, it was called the Millennial Money Meetup, and if you're on my email list or follow me on Twitter or read my blog, you're totally in the loop. Um, but basically it was an event that I held here in Toronto. It was graciously sponsored uh, and supported by EQ Bank, and I was joined by kind of Toronto top personal finance bloggers and experts, including Barry Choi from Money We Have, Michelle Summerfield from The Classy Simple Life, she used to be called Budget Blog S, and Daniel Teo from Urban Departures. So it was a really cool event. I was honestly terrified. I hadn't organized event since my wedding three years ago, and this is a very different event. Um, but it was honestly kind of a smash success, if I do say so myself, not to break or anything, but we had a full house, almost 140 people attend, and all the seats were filled up, and I got a lot of great feedback from people. Basically, this whole event was about bringing millennials together uh, to talk about money and to learn from each other about money. And the panel discussion was all about topics that millennials need to know when it comes to their money. And so it was awesome. And the coolest thing was I recorded it for a special episode of my podcast, of the Mo Money podcast. And I also live streamed it to Facebook. And so in case you missed the live stream, you weren't able to attend, but you really wanna know what we all chatted about, don't worry, I got you covered. I recorded it and uh, here you go. Thanks again for joining us. And uh, first let's uh, kind of introduce ourselves. I'll introduce myself first. I'm Jessica Morehouse. Um, if you don't know me, that is okay, but I am a personal finance blogger at jessicamorehouse.com. I am the host of the Mo Money podcast, which you can find on iTunes or SoundCloud. And I am the founder of the first Millennial Money Meetup here in Toronto, and I hope it's the first of many. And I'm very excited to uh, have these wonderful panelists here. These, if you don't know them yet, you will soon, because they are the top personal finance experts and bloggers, content creators in Toronto. And next to me, would you want to introduce yourself, Daniel? Sure. Okay. okay. <laughs> Hi, folks. My name is Daniel. Uh, first off, I'd just like to say thank you, Jessica, for having us on. I, and, and I'm in the very good company. And... Uh, I think these are some of the most relatable members of the personal finance community in, in Canada. i just like to say, uh, my name is Daniel, I'm a uh, father of two, uh, married, happily, and uh, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a, bitten by the travel bug, I'm a bit of a sci-fi geek, you know, I, and I write at Urban Departures as a way to uh, simplify personal finance for a rich and balanced life. Uh, really, I, th I think of it as personal finance on autopilot, if you will. And the, the intention there is, uh, you know, as, as career professionals, as, as family, uh, you know, as, as someone with young families, I find that we get pulled in so many different directions um, with so many different things vying for, for, you know, priority. And I feel that that's something that we, we have something that we can we have to offer to be able to address that. So we want to take what we have, establish a framework for managing money so that people can really get back to the things that they care about. So that's what we're about at urbandepartures.com. Thank right you. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. And thank you, Jessica, for hosting this fantastic event. And I'm in very good company. Um, I am Michelle Summerfield, and you might have uh, known me as Budget Bloggist, but I recently went through a rebrand, and my website is now theclassysimplelife.com. Um, I've realized recently that in order to really take control of your finances, you really need to simplify your life. So that's the direction that I'm moving in. I'm uh, moving away from stuff. I'm selling all my things. That's my latest adventure. Uh, I am probably the shopaholic of the group, <laughs> or I should say former shopaholic, because I have now taken care of that problem. And it, it is a big problem that affects a lot of us. So my message is basically overcoming uh, shopaholism and simplifying your life. Hey everyone, I'm Barry Choi. I blog at moneywehave.com where I'm a personal finance expert and I write a lot about budget travel and travel in general. And my thing is more about spending money on experiences instead of things. So I don't care what your experience is. As long as you're saving first, do whatever you want. All right. Well, 
without further ado, I guess let's start. So I've got a bunch of questions and I'm excited that so many people have filled out the kind of the money question box, their questions. So hopefully we can do another event and answer some of your specific questions. But for this first event, I've got, we kind of, you know, put our heads together and we're like, what are the most important things millennials need to know about money or what are some of the questions they're asking? And so we are going to address some of those today. And uh, the first one I've got here is how important is a budget? Why does everyone suggest just one. And that, it, it kind of, for me, it always seems like that's the first people, uh, first thing people tell you when you're just getting into personal finance, start a budget. So what are your guys, what are your thoughts on starting a budget? What's a budget mean to you? How do you budget and why is it so important? You're Who wants to go first? You're Barry? staring right at me. I don't know why. I, <laughs> so I got, I you know. <laughs> Uh, you know what? A budget is probably the most important thing you'll have when it comes to your finances because it really dictates what you're doing with your money. And more importantly, you gotta understand that budgets change. Your life changes, income changes, anything else. So you should constantly update it. But more importantly, like I was saying before, as long as you're saving first, then it really doesn't matter what you're spending on your, your money on other things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What do you think, Michelle? <laughs> budgets are very important, um, especially if you have a spending problem like me, mm -hmm. or like I did. Mm -hmm. um, it really lets you understand where you're spending your money, and then you can figure out why you're doing it. So once you figure out where those areas are that you're spending your money, maybe it's on, you're spending tons of money on Starbucks, or maybe you're spending it on bars all the time, you're going out with friends too much, you can really figure out, okay, well, why am I doing that? You can figure out your why behind it and realize, wait, maybe I'm doing that because I'm unhappy at my job. Or maybe there's something other, emo other emotional reason that you're spending your money that way. And, and budget really helps you to track your spending, figure out what's going on in the background. Daniel? <laughs> Thank you. I think to understand the importance of a budget, um, we need to take a look at the power of analyzing data. You know, if we're looking at Google or Facebook, we all know that we give them all of our personal information. What do they do with that? They take that and they use it to sell targeted advertisements, right? That's information that they take, they analyze trends, and so they can push things to you to make you buy things. We can think of it like, uh, you know, taking a poll in, a, in an election campaign or, you know, uh, stats from last night's Blue Jays game or today's Blue Jays game where they lost, right? It's, you, you can tell a player how good a player is by the numbers they put up or how good a team is doing by their last 10 games. Right? And, and really, it's, a, it's analyzing the data and understanding the trends behind your behaviors that will get you to, like Michelle said, to understanding what behaviors you need to change. A budget does exactly that. And without it, honestly, you're just flying blind. Mm -hmm. So if you want to set goals, if there are things that you want to achieve, you need that system in place to be able to get to where you want to go. There's, there's you know, whatever your goals are. You know, there's debt, there's down payment, there's Disneyland, what, whatever it is that you want, right? <laughs> Great answers, guys. <laughs> um, I'd say just from my personal experience and just kind of how I view budgets, uh, for me, my budget is a roadmap to my success. So every time I make a budget, and I'm a super nerd, and I've had the same budget kind of spreadsheet for the past six or seven years, and I've kept every single one. I change it whenever my income changes, my you know finances change in any way. I uh, kind of make a new tab in my spreadsheet, and so I, I know that's so nerdy, but I can look back to 20 you know 10 and see where I was at, and now I get to look at 2016 and see where I am, and it's it's really cool because you can see wow. I've come a long way. I made no money in 2010. How did I live? And it's, it's it, for me, yeah, it's, it's a way to kind of record my success and how I'm going. It gives me a roadmap to where I want to go, you know, saving for retirement, saving for trips, saving for a wedding, saving for a down payment. And it just gives me peace of mind, honestly. Without my budget, I'd probably just be floating in the clouds. <laughs> Well, and it lets you track your net worth as well. Yes. You can see the progress you're making that way as exactly. well. Not only that you've changed your spending habits, but if you're net worth oriented and you're trying to build up that nest egg or build up exactly for travel, like you were saying, you can see that line going up. Exactly, exactly. All right, so 
Next, we're going to talk about debt. Um, how do you suggest best managing debt? Now, how, how many of us have dealt with debt personally? I've had a student loan. It was tiny, but I still had it. Now I have a mortgage, so I'm in that for a while. <laughs> and, and you guys, what, what about you, Daniel? So for me, I guess the reality is that debt is, in, in some situations, it's unavoidable. So coming out of school, I ended up with $30,000 in student loans, and that's a tough pill to swallow. I, I think I was talking about it earlier, and we're, we're talking about, you know, you, you hold off until the uh, no interest payments six months after, and then you realize, oh crap, I have to actually pay this back, right? So really, in, in terms of addressing it, um, uh, you know, we're, we're all super nerds here. <laughs> With $30,000, working, working backwards, we're, we're looking at, if I wanted, I, I figured, okay, I don't want to make minimum payments. I want to pay this off as quickly as I can. Six years seems like a reasonable timeline. Working backwards, that worked out to about $500 a month. For me, that, it was a bit of a stretch, to be honest. But what that, what that meant was I needed to cut in my budget, like we talked about, cut back a little bit on the things that I felt that weren't necessarily required and put forward my plan in action to be able to achieve my end goal. So, you know, along the way there, you know, I, I rented a base, basement room apartment. That was not the, the happiest or the funnest times, right? But you do what you got to do to get to where it is that you want to go. Exactly. I agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> you do have to make sacrifices, um, especially when your spending gets out of control and you're wondering why, you know, what's going on here? I've got fancy car. I've got all these nice clothes in my wardrobe for my fancy corporate job. And where has it gotten me, you know, $30,000 in debt? Or, you know, if you come out of school, you're... You, like you were saying, you've already got that debt and then you're just heaping more on top of it when you do get that corporate job and you're thinking, well, I need the wardrobe and I need, you know, I need the car. It's, it's, I want, I want, or you think you need it. And you really have to manage it by making, by making sacrifices. You do have to sacrifice some of those things. You have to say, no, I have to, I have to cut back and it has to, you need to make it, um, you need to make it a priority. And you also have to remember that this time in your life will pass. You will get past it. It's not something that's going to be permanent unless you make it permanent. It's all a choice. It is up to you to make that change. You just have to be, you know, diligent in making debt a priority and cutting some of those things back. Okay, I guess I'll take the more practical approach. <laughs> answer for this. So if you've got any debt, you got to look at what debt it is, what's the interest rate. So credit cards have an average interest rate of close to 20%. So if you're making just some minimum payments on your credit card, you're never, ever going to pay that off. If you ever looked at your statement, it might say, I'll pay $10, but it'll be paid off the full balance in about 50 years. So I don't know about you, but I don't want to be paying off my credit card and everything else when I'm 80. Let's pretend. Let's say 60, okay? <laughs> so that's your obvious thing. So you want to look at that, but there's a lot of strategies too. So if you've got some high interest debt with your credit cards, you can look at low interest credit cards, right? Maybe do a balance transfer, which will give you some relief for six months, just to kind of get ahead just for a little bit. But that being said, there's also, if you've got Say you've got multiple debt accounts, but you've got one that's only $1,000. Maybe psychologically, it makes more sense for you to pay that $1,000 off right away. So then you've only got to worry about your other ones. But like these guys said, you've got to make those sacrifices because it's not going to take care of itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Great points. Um, I say for me... Um, Debt, I mean, it, it is very personal. Everyone has different debt. Um, and yeah, the kind of the, you know, rule of thumb is to attack the debt that has the highest interest rate. But sometimes when you have lots of different debts, it gets overwhelming and you're like, how am I going to ever pay off forty, fifty thousand dollars in debt? For me, and especially from lots of people that I've, I've been uh, interviewing people for my podcast, there's kind of a listener series, just regular people telling me about um, how they're tackling debt or, or what they're doing with their money. What I've been hearing a lot is people like to chunkify it, so they like to see where all their debt is and then attack the smallest amounts and then they get a little win. And then they're like, okay, I did that. Maybe I can do the next one. It's a bit bigger, but I know I can pay it off because I just did that first one. And then just kind of go that way. So I know that's one strategy that lots of people use that seems like it could be uh, a good way to go if you're wondering how to attack your debt. All right, so the next uh, kind of topic I want to talk about is what are some of the best personal finance habits to build? And I feel like personal finance is very habits-based, and it's sometimes hard, and, and sometimes you don't really think about it that way, but 
for, I mean, you know, building a budget, sticking to a budget, tracking your spending, all that kind of stuff. Those are habits you have to build over time. Sometimes it takes years. So what, what are some of the best personal finance habits to build and how have you maybe built some of them and how have they affected your life or changed your life? You're staring at I me don't know. now. I'm not staring at anyone in particular. I just happened. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, well, for me, it was um, spending my money wisely. That that was the biggest change and and the habit that I had to develop because I spent so long spending it unwisely. I'd been spending it on clothing and travel and all these. Well, actually, too many things. That's, that's another bit of advice is try not to have everything because you can't. You ultimately can't. I, I don't like to say can't in front of you, but it, ultimately you can't buy anything unless you're a millionaire. Even then you can't have everything. You can't have the entire world. Um, so you have to develop that habit of spending wisely and also smart purchasing. Um, when you are buying things, you need to look at quality over quantity. You need to look at the quality of items. I know for the amount of time that I've been spending on clothing, I've finally honed my skills at purchasing quality clothing. And you realize that something that's a little bit more expensive today will last you a lot longer. And as long as you're not into all the fast fashion and all the trends, um, you can have a few trendy items, but really you want to have a core classic wardrobe that's quality. Or even with anything, even with a vehicle, you have to look at the quality level and say to yourself, this item's probably going to, item Y is going to last me 10 years. Item X is only going to last me a year. So you need to look at that. It's basically the simple math of return on investment. Is, it, is that item going to last longer and be worth it? worth the cash outlay in the beginning. For me, I think it's about being smart. So all of us, we know a lot about money, but we're no different from anyone else there. We have to learn about it. So there's so many great personal finance books out there. Uh, you know, Million Dollar Teacher is one favorite of mine, Walking Like Rabbits. If you take the time to read one personal finance book, it might take you 10, 15, 20 hours, whatever. But I guarantee you, you'll know more than 80% of the population when it comes to money. It's that simple. You realize how easy it is. But also, it's about taking advantage of what's offered to you. So one of my things I always tell people is, if someone offers you free money, you take it. So think about your job. Think about what benefits are available to you. There's so many people out there who have pensions or stock plans. Not, it's becoming very rare. Don't get me wrong. But take a look at what's offered to you. So if you've got children, you're talking about RSPs, the CSG grants, uh, or even tax breaks. So as long as you understand what's available to you, you should be trying to take advantage of it. So I think uh, the building of habits, that, it's, that's, that's a very good question. I, I think that uh, it's, it's a little bit too generic of a question to be able to fit the different personality types that are out there. So I, I think that, so, you know, taking a page out of my family's book, and I'm going to pick on my wife a little bit here, <laughs> she's a little bit more of an impulsive spender. So the habits that she works on is more around uh, the, the activities of trying to control the triggers to curb spending. So some things that she, she might, she, she's tried before um, are unsubscribing from brand newsletters, for, for example. You know, if you're not, if you're not exposed to it, you're, you're less inclined to, to uh, pursue it. Um, or, you know, uh, foregoing a shopping trip altogether. Some, something like that that fits your personality. Me, on the other hand, I'm not an impulsive shopper. I'm actually a little bit more lazy. So, uh, so, so the way that I approach it is I, I still have habits that I need to work on. Part of me being lazy means I hoard money and I just leave it sitting there not doing anything. What I have to work on and what I try and work on actively is to try and automate those processes so I can think about that less and, you know, like I said, get back to the things that I want to focus on. So, that's, uh, so, so I guess to sum that up, Depending on your personality, you, you got to understand your motivations and in, in, in why it is that you're you're pursuing that purchase, and then use that to develop your strategy to kind of tackle that. So, mm -hmm. great. <laughs> um, when I think about habits, I think about one that I've 
haven't successfully, you know, figured out a way to do. I've tried lots of different things. The w one habit that I'm trying to get better at of, because I know it's very important, is tracking my spending. Um, I definitely keep track of um, my budget and how much money is in every account. I tend to uh, check all of my accounts at least once a week or sometimes daily if I'm bored <laughs> and just want to see how things are going. But uh, I like to think that tracking your spending is probably one of the biggest things that you could do. The biggest question I bet you, I bet all of us have asked ourselves, where did all my money go? Or why is my credit card so crazy right now? I don't remember spending anything on it. And so that's definitely something that I think is very important. And I'm not, you know, saying that I'm perfect at it, but I'm definitely trying. So I think that's something we should all try a bit better at. Um, all right, this one is about investing. So, you know, we've kind of talked about budgeting and uh, saving a little bit. Now let's talk about investing. What advice would you give to millennials who want to start investing? I know uh, lots of people I know, you know, they've kind of figured out a way to tackle their debt. They're starting to save a little bit. They've got a budget in place. Kind of the next step is investing, but they don't know where to go, what to do. It seems very complex and confusing, and I totally get it. So what, what do y'all think about that? <laughs> Barry, I am looking at you this time. <laughs> uh, if you're thinking about investing, the first thing to do is just start doing it. The power of compound interest, when you think about it over your investing years, let's say you're starting at 25, investing to your 65. Just the natural returns is going to get you where you need to be as long as you're setting aside enough money. Now, if you, you can make excuses all you want. You're like, oh, I'll start investing later, but you're not going to invest later. That's the reality. And for millennials these days, it's interesting. There's more tools available than there have ever been ever, pretty much. You know, you've got robo advisors, you've got more wealth management advisors who are adapting to what millennials needs. So all you gotta really do is just go out there and seek help. At the same time, you can invest on your own. Remember I was talking about reading a book? It's the same idea. You can just learn about it and then you figure out when you need to get help, right? The resources are available to you. All right, I'll, yeah, I'll take that one. <laughs> Mix it up. Yeah, all right, so. How to get started with investing, I think there's, there's uh, I guess I would say this. If you're looking for a place to start, check out index investing for two reasons. The first of which is it's not that hard to pick up. The second reason is you, you get, you will, your money will grow, and you don't have to take a lot of time to manage it. So essentially, let me, let me, let me take, you, take you through an example here. Warren Buffett, we all know Warren Buffett. He bet a hedge fund manager $1 million that his passive index fund, which takes not, not a lot of time to set up, would outperform his, what, his, the pick of the hedge fund manager's funds over 10 years. Over 10 years. So this is, this is Warren Buffett saying, you, you go pick whatever you choose. I'm just going to invest in the market as it is, and we'll see who wins. This is eight years in this year. The index is up 66%, whereas the other guy is up 21%. So you tell me which one's better. I, 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 that's just you know that's just the numbers, right? That we, we talked about the power of the numbers. So with that in mind, I'm, I'm not saying that the market can't be beat. You know, there are very smart people that that will be able to do it. I'm just saying that if you were one of those people, you wouldn't be here tonight. Sorry, I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, so with that in mind, I would I, I would recommend two uh, books. Barry mentioned one of them. The first one actually is. Uh, by a gentleman by the name of uh, William Bernstein. He wrote a 15-page booklet called If You Can. And I love the title because it's really If You Can. Um, it talks about the approach to index investing, the ph philosophy behind it, why people get so riled about, up about the emotions of trying to time the market and beat the market, and, why, and, and eventually why you end up with probably better returns than 80% of the people just by investing in the market. So that's, that's the first thing. Uh, oh, uh, really important part. He says a seven-year-old can understand it, and it takes 15 mi minutes to manage in a year. If, if, if it's too, too good to be true, you know, think of Occam's Razor, right? It's, it's not too simple. Uh, the second piece is The Millionaire Teacher. Yeah. The Millionaire Teacher is a great book. That's actually what got me to start practically speaking. Um, there's a lot of good... Uh, practical startup as to what to invest in when it comes to uh, index funds. So people, I'm sure you've, you've probably heard of index funds before, but what does that mean? What funds are index funds? That, that book will point you in the right direction. Jeez, you guys took it away there. My goodness, okay. Um, 
the real place is just start. That's the biggest thing with investing is to just start. No matter what the amount is, start. I started when I was 16, the best advice that my father gave me. Um, I was working part-time at that point, so you know I could only put away $25 a month. So that's what I did. $25 a month either went into a GIC, which unfortunately no longer pays the 6% that it used to. Um, and then I eventually got into mutual funds, which unfortunately we've all learned now. Um, some of the management expense ratios, which are the fees associated with mutual funds, are a little bit on the outrageous side. So this is why you've heard Daniel and Barry suggesting index funds, because they're going to minimize your fees. They're going to be your lowest cost option. So if you really do want to get into the stock market, you can look into index funds. Several of the banks, several of the robo-advisors, uh, there's many companies out there that have low cost. They have different levels. There's some that are beginner level, and then they work their way up. Um, I've actually got a different resource on that one. I love Canadian Couch Potato. His website is amazing, and uh, it's, it's great for someone just starting out. He actually gives solutions for beginner investors, and he gives examples as well. So he says, if you're investing $10,000, here's how you should split it up. Because when you're investing money, you don't want to be all in in one particular area of the market, because what can happen is your whole balance can just drop. So let's say... Let's say, for example, a great example is Britain. What just happened with Britain? Brexit. Everybody knows Brexit. If you were invested primarily in the foreign markets, you potentially could have seen a huge drop. So if you had all your money in international markets, in an international index fund, everything would have gone down. Now, obviously, things have come back up a bit, but the whole point is to be balanced. So you want to be balanced when you start this, no matter what the dollar value is. If you do decide with index funds, be balanced. And that's where Canadian Couch Potato is great because he gives you those examples where he says, put 25% into Canada, put 25% into US. And it's based on your tolerance. So again, we go back to personality. What is your, what is your tolerance? Like how willing are you to lose a certain percentage of your money? Are you willing to have big gains, but the possibility of a big drop? You got to look at your personality, and he he gives you examples for all of those, which is fantastic. So check out Canadian Couch Potato. That's my my one reference. Absolutely, yeah, great resource. I've got a different resource than y'all. Uh, John Robertson has a book called The Value of Simple, and it also goes into. Uh, like very specific detail about index fund investing, which is awesome. There's also a podcast episode. I interviewed him, a little plug there. Also, I did one with Barry about index fund investing, so y'all should check that out too. Um, but I kind of agree with you. You know, GICs, mutual funds, they aren't what they kind of were, and index funds and ETFs are kind of the cool new thing to invest in. But before you kind of get into all of that stuff, my main tip is start right now if you haven't, yet. The sooner you start, the better you'll be off in the future. That's kind of the, the big rule of thumb that every personal finance book will ever tell you is even if you don't think you can afford it, still, yeah, put $25 a week or a month in something. So you create that habit, then you start kind of putting more money and more money into it. It becomes a habit. You don't even notice that you're putting money away. It doesn't really change your lifestyle. But then over the, you know, several years, you're like, wow, look, look at how big that's grown. I'm so glad I started. And it's great if it's locked away in an RRSP because you yes. can't touch it. Exactly. And also so if the you're tax tempted benefit, to so. dip into an account, you can't because the tax man will come and take 40% of your money from you. Um, so I'm kind of getting the cue that we should wrap up because apparently we can yab for a while and didn't realize we'd get through these uh, questions like this. So um, for the last question, I'm going to say, what are some of the things that you guys are saving for? What are some of your savings goals? I think it's always really helpful to find out what other people's savings goals are so we can kind of be like, huh, maybe I should think about or, oh, I didn't know I should start saving up for that. What do you, what do you all think? Barry? I'm always saving for travel. It's like my one thing that I don't mind spending a lot of money on. It's my one vice. I'll sacrifice everything else, but I won't give up travel. I will never do it. Okay, I love travel as well, but Barry, I'm not gonna sacrifice my retirement. I don't wanna live in a cardboard box. 
<laughs> so that's travel is one of mine that I save my money up for. Um, retirement is obviously a portion, and then also learning and growth. Um, for me, constantly learning throughout life is. Um, I'm a firm believer in that, that you need to continuously learn. You should never stop. Um, there's a new term actually out there for retirement called rewirement. Apparently, all the um, baby boomers, the 60s and 70-year-olds, they're all changing things up because they don't want to stop. They don't want to stop working, but they do realize that they have to leave the corporate world, so they're moving on and creating small businesses, and they keep going. So learning and growth is a huge one. This is the fun one. <laughs> hey, you know, you never know. So, so I think, uh, okay, so we do the, uh, you know, in index investing to save for our future. I have, I have small children, so we put aside money in, in the RSP for them. Um, you know, you get, you get the priorities uh, out of the way. And every month we put aside a certain chunk of change to travel. We're just like, we're, 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 we're so we, get along. Like, we, we do get along. And what, what we do is, you know, this, this year, we, we spent a month in the Philippines. We're, we're headed to uh, Copenhagen and, and, and uh, Iceland with the kids uh, just in a little bit. And that's, that's a product of being able to prioritize, use the budget, you know, use the tools that we have available to us and set those goals you know, that work for us. Uh, travel might not necessarily be your thing, uh, but, but just think about that one thing that you wish you could do that you never had the chance to be able to and use the tools that you have to, to be able to you know, go read a book and, and work out your budget, figure out why it is that you're spending your money in places that aren't getting you to where you wanna go. And then, and then do it. <laughs> so. All right, for me, well the big thing was buying a place, but I bought a place now. So now I'm kind of on to what my next, oh a high five, oh I got a high five, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm sorry we didn't get to talk about that topic. That was like my next question, but we don't have time for it. Maybe next time. Um, for me, I'm trying to figure out what my next savings goal is. Travel is obviously very important. I love to travel, but I also have to go, you know, I'm from Vancouver, so I have to make sure I go there at least twice a year, so I'm always saving up for that. Um, another thing I always save up for is education. I have gone back to school numerous times, and it just always I always find something new to learn, so I need to pay for it somehow, and I don't want to take out student loans. So that's another thing. Um, but for me, I think the biggest thing for me, why I put so much importance on saving money is to me, the more money I have, the more secure I feel. I sleep better at night. So it's kind of honestly my biggest savings goal why I save is to sleep better at night, to feel like I'm not, you know, chained to debt or a, a circumstance because I can't afford to get out. So that's kind of that's kind of me, guys. So before we kind of let you guys go, I, you know, just in case people want to learn more about us, can we go down the room and, and see where can people find you, Barry? Right here, they right, want, now. right now. Right now. Right now, afterwards, come find me. How, What's your website and how can they find you on Twitter? Um, moneywehave.com is my website and Twitter, I'm at Barry Choi. Michelle? Okay, website is theclassysimplelife.com and Twitter is at Mish Summerfield because Michelle Summerfield was taken. <laughs> Urbandeparturist.com. I, I uh, write with my, uh, myself, Daniel, Tio, uh, my, my wife as well. Uh, you can find us on Instagram, U uh, Urban Departures, and as well at Twitter at U Departures. Fabulous. And of course, you can find me at jessicamorehouse.com. Not hard to figure that one out. And my Twitter is J-E-S-S-I underscore Morehouse, because also someone else took Jessica Morehouse. It's not nice when they take it's your name. It's not cool. They should know that I am the Jessica Morehouse. You're going to get the blue check mark? Yeah. No, I don't have that yet. I'm, I'm working on it. So thank you so much for joining us. We're going to have a few uh, minutes to kind of mingle and chat after, but thanks again for being part of the first Millennial Money Meetup. Thank you. Money Meetup.